Are science and faith really at war with one another? If you're a person of faith, you have to put your brain on mute in order to avoid thinking critically. If you're a laboratory scientist, do you avoid telling your friends that you have faith in God and love your neighbor? Why are atheists and agnostics so angry these days at religious people? Well, fasten your seatbelts. That's where we're going. Hi, I'm Ted Peters. Fasten your seatbelt because we're about to take a wild ride into critical thinking. We'll ask some simple questions and get multiple answers. What happens if you want to report on a war and you learn that peace has broken out? Take a look at this cartoon, which we find in conservative Christian magazine. Sure looks like war to me. Who are the combatants? Well, on the one side, we have evolution identified with Satan. Evolution is a science, right? Then we have uh, creation in Christ and the other army, and they're both shooting at each other. But notice the balloons on the top of the evolution castle. Divorce. Abortion. Homosexuality. Those are moral issues. doesn't matter what you affirm or disconfirm. The category is that they're moral issues. They're not scientific issues. The flag is humanism, whereas the flag on the other side is Christianity. They're going bang, 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 bang. <laughs> on the top of that Christian fortress, we got a guy shooting to the right. Is that bad, eh? Or a different enemy? <laughs> What's going on there? In Berkeley, where I teach, we fight our wars on the rear of the trunk of our car. That's where our weapons are. Take a look at this fish. It's an ichthus, the Greek word for fish, but it's actually an acrostic, Yodo Kappa Theta Upsilon Sigma, which stands, translated in English, for Jesus Christ, God's Son, and our Savior. On the trunk of a car of a Darwinian evolutionist, we find this fish. Imagine the long story of evolution when fish grow legs and crawl on the land and began, become amphibians and reptiles and then eventually, of course, warm-blooded animals leading to the human race. That'll get those Christians, right? But the Christians counterattack. So the scientists launch a counter to the counterattack. Not every scientist counterattacks. Here's Werner Heisenberg. One of the founders of quantum physics, and along with Niels Bohr, the indeterministic interpretation of quantum physics, known as the Copenhagen School. He was a German. The first gulp from the glass of natural sciences will make you an atheist. But at the bottom of the glass, God is waiting for you. Here's a simple question. <clears throat> Is it in fact the case that in our society we have two different armies? One made up of intelligent, rational, empirical, evidence-based scientists who give us the truth over against Stupnagel, 
Christians and Muslims and other religious dingbats who sacrifice their critical thinking capacity in order to believe narrow-minded dogma and embrace racial prejudice and in every respect try to retard the progress of society? Is that is that the reality within which we live? Or could it be a bit more complicated? Well, as you suspect, I think it's a bit more complicated than that. If we ask people, what do you think is the relationship between science and religion or science and faith or science and theology? And I think of theology as the intellectual reflection on the commitments of faith, we will find that some people actually do believe there's a war going on, but the majority, whether they're on the science side or on the religious side, don't believe there's a war going on. In fact, they see the relationship between faith and science is really quite differently. So let's divide these two groups into warfare models and non-warfare models. And as I said earlier, fasten your seatbelt because it's going to get complicated. Now, you don't have to read all of this immediately. Just note that if we try to categorize the way people think, and I'm actually more concerned about the way scholars think, but yeah, the average person on the street might have a version of this. There are four different ways or four different, shall we say, armies fighting for something in the war uh, between religion and science, but there are six, six different models that are quite prevalent that we might call peace or interaction or cooperation or shared aspiration models. And we're going to take a look at all 10 of them. So pour that coffee into the coffee cup or put a little more ice in that Diet Coke or take another handful of popcorn. We're going to go there. The text for this analysis of 10 different models or ways of relating science and religion can be found in this particular article published in 2018, Science and Religion, 10 Models of War, Truce, and Partnership in Theology and Science. And you can see the uh, way to access it on the web there. So if you've read it already, I will simply reinforce what you already know. If you have not read it, then I will introduce it. And you might find the detail and 150 footnotes to try to document uh, the veracity of what it is that I'm saying here in 10 Models of War, Truce, and Partnership. In the presentation that follows, we have four goals, things that we want to accomplish. And the first is to demythicize the alleged war between science and faith. By myth here, I mean it's a sort of mental construct or framework that the media uses. It can't really, uh, the media cannot really uh, investigate what's going on because it looks at everything through this rather narrow and limited framework. So we got to get rid of the myth. Uh, secondly, <clears throat> Scientific knowledge all by itself is a wonderful thing. It's a gift to you and I or any of us who believe in God and want to appreciate this magnificent creation. Scientific knowledge enhances all of that. So uh, what we need to do is use science to construct and enhance and broaden and deepen our understanding of the world 
as something that God loves and that we are here to enjoy. Uh, the numbers three and four have to do with uh, ministry. And the ministry within congregations, whether Christian, Jewish, Islamic, or other faith communities, needs to provide an atmosphere within which the scientists who are present are going to be respected and applauded and um, ask our scientists to be good stewards for constructing our understanding of the world in light of our religious uh, commitments. Fourth and finally, religious communities owe the wider society, the planetary society, uh, moral responsibility. And whenever we try to shoulder that responsibility for making this a better world, we had better be scientifically informed. The educated public is already scientifically informed. So there ought to be some consonance between any pronouncements that we make theologically and the uh, ethical or moral or social mandates or even directions that we try to provide uh, for social betterment and social transformation. There ought to be consonance between what we think theologically and what we think scientifically. With all of this in mind, we actually have a three-pronged structure to the way of thinking. We, first of all, need to understand science as the scientists themselves understand it. We also need to think theologically. By theology, I mean intellectual reflection on the commitments of faith. So theology is to religion what science is to nature, so to speak. But culture is so important. Both science and religion are embedded in culture. And more than that, there are religious dimensions in culture that don't just belong to churches. <laughs> it's The religious dimension of culture is not just institutional in character. I like to rely on Paul Tillich's understanding of the isomorphism between culture and religion. And he has an oft-repeated aphorism that will behoove us to keep in mind here. Religion is the substance of culture, and culture is the form of religion. So when we're talking about religion, we're not just talking about what people do in their churches. There are moments in which science can be religious. Nobody wants to admit it, but those moments can come. It's the task of the theologian to point it out. Now for a moment of historical background. The world today has accepted the new academic discipline of theology and science, or science and religion. Things were not always hospitable to looking at science and religion together, but this guy, Ian Barber, unfortunately passed away in 2013. Ian is the one who gave birth to the new field of science and religion in 1966. And he wrote a book and said it is time for theologians and scientists to get together and attend the same barbecue. He is the one who gave us this idea of models. That is to say, there are at least in his mind four different ways in which people assume there's a relationship between science and religion. The first one is conflict. That's our word war. Uh, there's a conflict between science and religion. Some people think. Barber, of course, didn't, but some people think that. Independence means that science and religion go their separate ways and they just don't go to each other's barbecues. I call this the two-language view, but Dr. Barber called it the independence view. Dr. Barber, by the way, was both a physicist and a theologian. 
Then dialogue, which is a step beyond independence. Dialogue is when science and religion, having gone their separate ways, come back and talk to each other. And when you have dialogue, you really try to understand one another from the other's point of view. Dialogue isn't just blabbing. It's really an attempt to move towards understanding. Then finally, integration. Integration for Dr. Barber was having a worldview in which God and the world, un the world understood through microscopes and telescopes, all fit together in one single metaphysical scheme. Now, he had his own preferred scheme. It was Whiteheadian process metaphysics. But whether you buy that metaphysics or a different metaphysics, the point is there are some people, they're rare, <laughs> uh, who are able to integrate everything they know scientifically with everything they know theologically into a single worldview. In some ways, you could set that as your goal. But what we're going to do in the presentation that follows is try to refine these four models because they're a little bit too simple in my judgment. We're going to try to show in a little bit more detail that those people who believe in conflict, those people who believe in war, are not all the same. There are some differences. But for the most part, Dr. Barber's contribution here is one that we're going to build on. We're certainly not going to uh, set it aside. We're going to start with the warfare models. Take a look. There are four of them. The first two, one and two, represent the anti-religious view, scientism and scientific imperialism. Then ecclesiastical authoritarianism would be a religious view that subordinates science to religion. And then finally, the evolution controversy. Oh, that's probably the biggest battle in the whole war. Has there always in history been a warfare fought? between progressive scientists on the one side and recalcitrant Luddite religious people on the other side? Well, that view of history didn't appear until after 1859. In 1859, Charles Darwin published his book on the origin of species, and then some people went back and rewrote history. <laughs> So it looked like the battle between uh, evolution and its detractors is just one more fight in a long historical war. And one of the chief voices, at least in the United States, was that of Andrew Dixon White, uh, who at the beginning of Cornell University wanted to make sure that we would have a university standing for science over against the hundreds of Protestant and Roman Catholic colleges and universities, which were doing everything they could to educate the American people, we would have one that would stand for science against all those religious institutions. Andrew Dixon White did not invent the idea of a warfare between science and religion. He borrowed it from John William Draper, but he did expand it and provide uh, more historical anecdotal evidence in order to support the thesis so that by the end of the 19th century, at least in North America, it became accepted that religion and science were in conflict. But just note, there's only one issue. There's only one science. That's Darwinian evolution. What about all those other sciences? As we jump to our own period of time, who is it that believes a war is going on? And 
in whose army do you and I want to fight? Well, this is one army. We're going to give it the name scientism. Note the ISM at the end of the word. Science is a research program to understand the natural world. Scientism, because it has an ISM, is an ideology. So what does the ideology of scientism assert? The answer is there's only one reality, the physical natural reality, and nothing beyond it. And science and science alone is the prophet. That is to say, science and science alone reveals to us what physical reality is. So take a look at uh, a little um, advertisement that lists the saints of scientism in the uh, modern world. And you notice Charles Darwin is uh, front, center, and top. Uh, Carl Sagan there to the right, where did he teach? Oh, a place called Cornell University. Well, what is it that these scientists, note the word scientists is big there, it doesn't say philosopher, it doesn't say ideologue, it doesn't say what their political party is, it says scientists. What do these have in common? They have rejected the supernatural. If you're a scientist, you have to reject the supernatural. No, you just look for natural explanations for natural phenomena. That's what you do. But if you're going to reject the supernatural, that's a philosophical position. And then secondly, they have worked to improve this world. This is in italics. Well, you know, those stoop religious people, they believe in another world. Angels, life after death. Whereas the adherents to scientism want to make this world a better place. So we have two things being said here. If you are an advocate of scientism, you reject the supernatural on behalf of the natural, and you're morally committed to making this world a better place. That's the army of scientism. Do you want to fight in it? Here's one of the generals in Scientism's army, Richard Dawkins, who's a professor of science education at Oxford University in the United Kingdom. He articulates the cardinal doctrine of scientism, namely that science is the only path to knowledge, which means that if you and I try to find knowledge about reality in any other source, whether that be poetry or literature or history or art or religion or mystical inspiration, that all of that is false knowledge because the only thing that counts as genuine knowledge is the knowledge that the scientist can give you. When it comes to engaging in the battle the marching orders that Richard Dawkins gives begins with, I'm attacking God, all gods, anything and everything supernatural, wherever and whenever they have been or will be invented. So if you believe in God, uh, it's not the result of a revelation from God. No, no. It's the product of your and my inventing the idea of God, which means God is non-existent. Dr. Dawkins, he knows. He knows the truth about these things. His army is going to win. Peter Atkins is a foot soldier in Scientism's army. He teaches physical chemistry at Oxford University. Note how he pulls the trigger and fires the really big bullet. Science is the only path to understanding. So if Scientific understanding were to get too close to religion, it would get contaminated by falsehood. So if you happen to believe that there is a spiritual reality, then that's an illusion caused by physical reality. What's the source of our spiritual illusions? Well, it's the physical brain. This is Houston Smith, who fought against scientism on behalf of the religious army. Dr. Smith, when he died a few years ago, was 
a Methodist, but far more importantly, was world renowned for his study of the great religions of the world and spent so much time examining firsthand experientially Chinese religions and Indian religions, etc. And he taught for a while at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, and he got fed up, <laughs> fed up with the worldview of people who embrace scientism. And note here how he, as an enemy, describes the two big arrows in the scientism, in scientism's quiver, and that the first one is, of course, the assumption that only knowledge that is valid comes through science. And then secondly, the only reality, metaphysical, metaphysically speaking, the only reality is a natural reality and that supernatural things don't exist. And Dr. Smith spent his life understanding and appreciating the spiritual dimension, the unseen, the eternal, the dimension of reality that gives life all of its meaning. And he just couldn't fit all of those religious sensibilities into the worldview of those who believe in scientism. Alan Wallace is a Buddhist and he fights in the religious army over against scientism. Here he is saying that, don't be confused, science as science is a great thing. It tells us about how our natural world works. But scientism is a philosophy, it's an ideology, it's a metaphysics that's unwarranted. Scientism is not just an ideology. It's not just the luxury of some fat cat professors who sit in their chairs in universities today and pontificate about the evils of religion on behalf of the uh, pure knowledge gained by science. It can be translated into rather vigorous political movements. That's what happened in China, and it has been happening for over a century now. At the end of the 19th century, in the beginning of the 20th, many Chinese felt they were beleaguered and downtrodden because of British colonialism and the strength of tiny little Britain over against gigantic China appeared <clears throat> to be due to science and technology. Science and technology appeared to be the horizon of the future, and so revolutionary movements rose up in the beginning of the 20th century in China that wanted to put away those religious traditions of Confucius and Lao Tzu and Buddha and replace all that with science. It would be science that would give China the power to throw off the British Empire, to throw off European colonization, and China could rise again to the position of world dominance. Here are three slogans from the Republic of China in the first third of the 20th century, down with Confucianism. Science is all powerful. Science can save the nation. Look at that. Science can save China. So when Mao Zedong and the Marxists, which were materialists and atheists, in the 1930s and 40s were able to take over the leadership of the People's Republic of China. They simply absorbed the Republic of China's emphasis on scientism over against religion. And all through the post-World War II period, scientism in its Marxist form has marched on and on. It's not over.
We have just taken a look at scientism, the first of the warfare models. Now we're going to leave scientism and go to a second model, very close, very similar, but slightly different. We're going to call it scientific imperialism. Whereas scientism is an army that wants to eliminate religion, decimate the enemy. Scientific imperialism sees something good in religion, but the scientific imperialist believes that a scientized version of religion is stronger and better than the religious traditions that we have inherited. Here's Paul Davies, actually one of my favorite uh, scholars and a good friend and a very uh, smart guy. And his exciting contribution to the dialogue since the 1980s has been to show how through the microscopes and telescopes of the scientists, we can see realities that were already treasured by religious sensibilities prior, but note, note the hinge here on which this particular sentence turns. Science has actually advanced to the point where what were formerly religious questions can be seriously tackled by the new physics. So our classic religious questions should be turned over to the physicists. Legitimate questions. But the physicist can now tell us more than our priests and sages and philosophers of the past can tell us. That's scientific imperialism at work. Take a look at this list of uh, scientific disciplines, evolutionary biology, molecular biology, genetics, these refer to those hardworking scientists who go into the laboratory and conduct experiments on the physical world and come out with explanations of biological processes that are extremely valuable, not just for understanding nature, but in some cases actually lead to medical therapies that make you and me healthier. It's great science. Sociobiology and evolutionary psychology, however, are ideologies. They are attempts to explain the human condition at the cultural level, including psychology and sociology, as if they were biology. And many of the things they say are exciting, but <laughs> they're not empirical. They're simply an attempt to extend the hegemony of the natural sciences beyond biology into the domain of the human spirit. And that means the sociobiologists and evolutionary psychologists think they can explain religion better than religious people can explain themselves. So if you want to understand your religious beliefs, you don't go to your priest or your rabbi. No, you go to the sociobiologist or evolutionary psychologist and he or she will tell you what's really happening. Evolutionary psychology has given birth to the field, the cognitive science of religion. Drawing heavily on the field of evolutionary psychology, CSR theories try to explain the occurrence of religious components, beliefs, rituals, behaviors, and etc by the structure and operations of the human cognitive apparatus, that's our brains. CSR theorists look to the operations of human cognitive mechanisms or human cognitive capacities to explain religious phenomena. Do not ask your priest or rabbi to explain your religious experience. No, ask the cognitive scientist of religion. Now, if you are holding a picnic and you invite all your friends from the field of cognitive science of religion to your picnic, they will divide into two groups. The adaptationists will be in one group and the byproductists will be in the other. Well, what's going on there? Because evolution is the framework 
Many in this school of thought suggest, actually argue and contend, that religion appeared as a phenomenon amongst our evolutionary ancestors because it is adaptive. To be adaptive means you make more babies. So reproductive adaptation means that religion helped our ancestors make more babies that carried their genes on to future generations, and that's how evolution works. There's a smaller group amongst CSR theorists that say, no, religion is not adaptive. It's rather a byproduct. After all, the main thesis of the evolutionary psychologists is that at a certain stage in our evolutionary history, our brains got so big and our thoughts got so complicated that they partially escaped the genetic determinism and began to think about things and changing the evolutionary niche within which we live in such a way that our cognitive apparatus took over and influenced to some degree our evolutionary history. Religion is a byproduct, a spandrel. A spandrel is a decoration on a column in a large uh, building that does not contribute anything to its support. It's decorative. So according to the byproductist school, religion was not necessary for reproductive adaptation, but rather is a spandrel and extra. And of course, that suggests that now in our age of science, we can get along without it. Well, that's the framework. Let's take a look in the next slide uh, to an actual application of CSR, an explanation of why you and I or our ancestors became religious. Here is what Stuart Guthrie says, a classical cognitive approach to religion holds that we humans have a tendency to view and treat the world as alive and human-like, that is to animate and anthropomorphize it. Consequently, gods, demons, and the like are part of a spectrum of human-like beings we think we discern in the world. The world is actually inanimate, but our religious ancestors mistakenly thought it was animate, and that's how and why they devised gods, demons, and the like. So the origin of religion is found in the mistaken perception that inanimate things are in fact animate things. Oh, wow. Thank you to the cognitive science of religion for finally explaining why it is that I'm religious, or if you happen to be religious, why you're religious. It's due to mistakenly treating inanimate things as animate. I am so glad I now understand, thanks to the CSR scientists. One of the difficulties with CSR is that it lacks empirical evidence or confirmation for its theories, but I'm going to help out CSR because I'm going to provide empirical support for the theory that the origin of religion is the misinterpretation of something inanimate as animate. Please meet my dog, Angie. Also meet my vacuum cleaner. Angie treats the inanimate vacuum cleaner as animate. Now, Angie does not pray, she does not sing hymns, uh, she does not feed the hungry or 
collect clothing for the homeless. She doesn't do any of these things, but she does interpret something inanimate as animate. And according to this criterion, Angie is religious. Here's an example of the sociobiologist or the evolutionary psychologist exerting what we're calling scientific imperialism. This is the centerfold of a Time Magazine article on, note the title, Science and Original Sin. Original Sin, isn't that a religious idea? A closer look shows that the Christian doctrine of original sin makes more sense as evolutionary psychologists learn more and more about why people do bad things. That is to say, we could give you an evolutionary or biological explanation for why human beings sin. Who needs a Bible? Who needs to listen to a sermon? Who needs theology? Just go to the evolutionary psychologist and get an evolutionary explanation for why we do bad things. If sociobiology or evolutionary psychology is going to provide a total and complete worldview, which explains the complexities and nuances of psychology and the wider culture in biological terms, then we're going to have to find precedence in our biological history to show that we can explain not just bad things, but also good things that human beings do. So of the best things that we human beings are capable of doing, of course, is loving our neighbor, as Jesus would say. We'll give that the technical word, word altruism. Is there altruism in nature? Well, yes, there is. So you're in my altruism. You're in my loving our neighbor for our neighbor's sake. Well, we inherited in our genes, the predisposition to altruism from our evolutionary history. Thank God for evolution. Our category here is warfare models, and the subcategory is scientific imperialism, an army that wants to conquer religion and take religion's spoils back home. How do you like this? Super scientists. Scientists must work together to save the world. Save the world? Who asked the scientists to save the world? Where did that come from? <laughs> we are looking at four models that presuppose warfare between science and religion. Scientism and scientific imperialism are anti-religion. Now, let's jump to the other side of the battle, and one army we'll look at is that of ecclesiastical authoritarianism. Imagine yourself a Roman Catholic in the final third of the 19th century in Europe. It looks like everybody's against you. You have the rise of secular states and democracy and the public school system. Armies are coming and taking away the papal states. It's not unexpected that the Vatican might respond defensively. And Pope Pius IX in 1864 publishes the syllabus of errors to point out the errors of the modern world. And one of them goes like this. It is an error for science or philosophy to withdraw from ecclesiastical authority. If theology is the queen of the sciences, and if there's a disagreement with what might be said scientifically or philosophically, then theology trumps 
I call that ecclesiastical authoritarianism. Curiously, a hundred years later, we have the Second Vatican Council, and the mood of the Vatican has changed quite a bit. Now it's a giornamento. Open the windows, let the fresh winds of modernity blow through the church. And so we get this in 1964. The natural sciences should be free from ecclesiastical authority. That is to say, academic freedom, which is an important doctrine in modern Western democratic society, academic freedom is now going to be honored and respected by the Vatican. This is Sayed Hossein Nasser, professor of Islamic studies at George Washington University. In my opinion, he's one of America's really great intellectuals. He's quite critical of the worldview that we've been calling scientism or naturalism or reductionism associated with uh, modern science because in reality, God is the author and creator of uh, all things. And if science can't see it, then there's a blindness right in, in science. So Nasser finds that he has to appeal again and again to the Quran to get the truth about reality. So I put him in ecclesiastical authoritarianism. He's not exactly like the Vatican, to be sure. But in this case, it's scripture trumps science. Here's my good friend, Muzaffar Iqbal. He's the editor of the very fine journal, Islam of Science. And Muzaffar, I and a third colleague in Lahore, Pakistan, uh, Noman Haq, edited this book, God, Life, and the Cosmos. And Mozafar, similar to Nasser, even though he himself is an evolutionary biologist, is critical of a worldview associated with science that leaves God out of the picture. So if we want the truth, we're going to have to go back to the Holy Quran in order to get a proper uh, vision or take on reality. It's special revelation in the Quran then that trumps uh, the knowledge we get through the methods of science. When it comes to contemporary theological movements, some continue to exhibit an anti-scientific bias. Latin American liberation theology, at least until recently, has been in that camp. Science belongs, say the theologians, to Western European imperialism and colonialism. Scientists are responsible for the evils of the nuclear threat, and if anything, um, liberation ethics and liberation theology needs to be anti-science, just as it is anti-establishment. In 1979, the World Council of Churches gathered religious leaders at MIT in order to press upon the religious communities of the world the need to cooperate with the scientific communities in the face of the ecological crisis. We have to do something to preserve our planet from losing its ability to support human uh, as well as animal and plant life. 
Unpersuaded were the liberation theologians and the feminist theologians, and Rosemary Radford Ruther, among others, rebelled, saying that science comes together with patriarchy along with Western dominance and colonialism and imperialism, and there should be no cooperation between liberation and feminism with the scientific establishment. Now, that changed after the Chernobyl disaster in 1986, and you'll find many liberation theologians and feminist theologians today participating uh, with scientists in the struggle to preserve the health of planet Earth. We turn now to our fourth in the warfare models, the evolution controversy. All the armies are fighting over only one spoil of war, and that's the question. Is Charles Darwin's theory of biological evolution good science or bad science? Take a look at our divine action bar graph here. The question is, how does God act in the natural world? Well, if you go to the right, <clears throat> you'll see the atheists. If you believe there is no God, then there is no divine action in the natural world. You can see materialism dangling down on the right like a loose shoelace. Previously, we called that scientism. It's the army with the banner that says there's only one reality, it's material reality, and the scientist is its prophet. If you move one increment to the left, that's where we get the laboratory scientists, the, one who want to do, the ones who want to do their research with no ideology. And that describes my friend Marty Hewlett, who helped me co-author these two books in which we try to tell you who is fighting with whom about what in the evolution controversy. Dr. Hewlett is a virologist. He needs Charles Darwin's theory of evolution in order to study viruses, not just to understand them, but to produce medicines that improve your and my health and well-being. At the same time, Marty is a devout Roman Catholic. He goes to Mass just about every day, except on those days when he likes to go skiing. Marty loves both Jesus Christ and Charles Darwin. Going to the left side, we see the interventionist God position which assumes that nature rolls happily along according to its own laws. So if God wants to act, God breaks a law of nature and gives us a miracle. It is the creationists who best exemplify the interventionist God theory. We can break the creationists into two sub-armies, the biblical and the scientific. According to biblical creationists, Darwin's theory of evolution is bad science because it contradicts the Bible. Islamic creationists, especially in Turkey, similarly hold that Darwin's view of evolution is wrong because it contradicts the Quran. The scientific creationists have a different kind of argument. They want to argue that Darwin's theory of evolution is wrong because it's bad science. Now, if we move one increment to the right, we come to the intelligent design school of thought, who will grant that there is evolutionary change over time, but the evolution from simple to complex organisms require the action of an intelligent designer. In this case, God is the intelligent designer. When we get to the theistic evolutionists in the middle, the theistic evolutionists affirm on the one hand that Charles Darwin's theory of evolution is good science, it's fertile science, and on the other hand that God is responsible for evolutionary change over time that brings into existence warm and fuzzy mammals, including Homo sapiens. 
Now, the point I want to make here is that every army fighting in the evolution controversy loves science. The one science they either like or don't like is Darwinian evolution, but they're certainly going to accept without question mathematics, physics, chemistry, geology. To fight in the evolution controversy does not require that you're anti-science. Now, that's all I want to say about the evolution controversy at this point. I intend to create another lecture or presentation and go into detail so that we'll know exactly who's fighting with whom over what. I would like to clarify an item of vocabulary. Let's not confuse the war between science and religion with what is called the war against science or the war on science. That's a term you'll hear used in the scientific community. The enemies that science perceives right now uh, include uh, the culture of alternative facts and fake news, especially on the internet where chaos seems to reign and nobody is standing up for reason and evidence-based uh, criteria for evaluating better and worse ideas. Scientists also don't like the theocracies of the Middle East where public school decisions are made by theocrats uh, rather than uh, Western educators. They do not, scientists do not like postmodern philosophy, especially deconstructionist postmodern philosophy, which, at least to the perception of the defensive scientists, looks like the baptism of relativism. If you're a scientist, you want to formulate a law of nature that is universally applicable. The postmodernists would say, oh no, if you do that, you're guilty of a meta narrative, and that's a big sin. So, from the scientific point of view, there are all these irrational forces at work, and science, and science alone, is out there to defend truth and factuality and rationality for the wider culture. Whether or not the scientific perception is accurate or inaccurate is almost beside the point. It's my own belief that religious people should, at least for the near future, side with science in defending evidence-based reasoning. Here's a Mormon. He loves science. We've had a few marches on behalf of science over against the enemies of science. Why can't religious people join that army? We'll now move into the non-warfare models, as I have been suggesting. Virtually everyone who thinks about it loves science, but there are different ways of putting together positively one's religious commitments and affirmation, if not participation, in scientific endeavors. Take a look at number five there, the two books. That'll be the first of our non-warfare models. God is revealed in two books, nature and scripture. What we learn from nature is that God is our creator, and what we learn from the special revelation in Scripture is that God is our redeemer. This idea of general and special revelation preceded the modern world, and it was carried on by the early scientists who gave us modern science. The four horsemen of modern science we might think of as Copernicus and Kepler, Galileo, and Newton 
all four of them believed in the two books. They believe that God thinks mathematically, and if we study the physical world in terms of mathematics, we will read the very mind of God. Certainly, that is what Galileo believed when he wrote his principal work, the dialogue on the two principal world systems, the Ptolemaic system with the sun in the center, I mean, with the earth in the center, the Copernican system with the sun in the center. And then he quotes St. Thomas Aquinas that the sacred writings revealing God are bound in two volumes, that of creation revealed in nature and redemption revealed in scripture. While Galileo uh, was in trouble, he had a defender, a Jesuit named Bellarmine, and Bellarmine gave us this nice little slogan that endures to the present day. The Bible tells us how to go to heaven, not how the heavens go. This is my friend, Bob Russell. Bob is both a physicist and a theologian, and we are in the Papal Gardens at Castel Gandolfo. And there used to be a library uh, high on the top floor, I think, of, uh, of the castle there, papal library run by the Jesuits. And what Bob is holding in his hand there is an original edition of Galileo's Dialogo, or Dialogue on Two World Systems. Are you a Presbyterian or a Baptist or United Church of Christ? Well, then maybe you have a special good feeling about John Calvin of Geneva. John Calvin was a two books person. The little singing birds are singing of God, he writes. The beasts cry to him. The elements are in awe of him. The mountains echo his name. The waves and fountains cast their glances at him. Grass and flowers laugh out to him. Calvin looked at nature directly. We can do that today as well, but we can also look at nature through microscopes and telescopes. And in both cases, Nature sings of its creator God. Meet Verna Harrison. Uh, she is a contemporary Eastern Orthodox theologian, and she presupposes a version of the two books. Scientific reason is also a facet of the divine image. That is to say, she says, that God has created the human race with the capacity for science as a way of returning to God, so to speak. People can use the methods of science to discern the patterns of the natural world, thus to think God's thoughts. Looking through telescopes and microscopes help us to think God's thoughts? Muslims, for the most part, are not two books thinkers. If you go back to ancient Uzbekistan, Samarkand is a city in uh, Uzbekistan, you can trace the development of some contributions to modern science, especially the development of uh, mathematics. Note this passage from Avicenna, who is thinking about mathematics. Does that take him directly to a revelation of God? Well, not exactly. Rather, indirectly, it's God's inspiration through prayer that contributes to his scientific insight. If a problem was too great for me, he writes, I repaired to the mosque and prayed invoking the creator of all things until the gate that had been closed to and what had been complex became simple. The Spirit of God works directly in the human mind, whether it be the faith of the Quran or the insight of science.
We turn now away from the two books model and take a look at number six in our list. It's a non-warfare model. We're going to call it the two language model. Ian Barber called it the independence model. In the two books, both nature and scripture reveal God. In the two language model, one language reveals the natural world and the other language reveals the relationship we have with God. Langdon Gilkey, one of my professors at the University of Chicago, was a strong proponent of the two languages view. He says that science and religion ask different questions. Science asks how, religion asks why. Science gives us facts, religion gives us meaning. We need to be bilingual if we are religious people living in a scientific world, said Dr. Gilkey. A few years ago, Stephen Jay Gould, who now has passed away, but was president of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, a strong atheist, very anti-creationist. And when Pope uh, John Paul II in October of 1996 uh, released an elocution affirming Darwinian evolution, uh, Dr. Gould wrote a book, and you can tell he has a sense of humor, in which he developed the so-called Noma Doctrine, non-overlapping magisteria, which is his way of affirming the two-language view. We, that's the scientists, we get the age of the rocks, and religion gets the rocks of the ages. Um, then, uh, quoting uh, Cardinal Bellarmine, we study how the heavens go and they determine how to go to heaven. Uh, funny, but uh, certainly a way of demonstrating respect uh, for science if you're religious and, and respect for religion if you are a scientist. Defenders of the two-language view tend to put facts and data into the scientific language and meaning, purpose, value, morality uh, into the religious <laughs> language. Note what's happening here in this cartoon that confuses the two languages. No doubt about it, Ellington. We've mathematically expressed the purpose of the universe. God, how I love the thrill of scientific discovery. Well, most scientists that I know and that you know would say, look, we're never going to find the purpose of the universe through science because we've bracketed purpose in the first place. In the academic world, the two-language model actually has been the dominant model, even though the media utterly ignores it. Interestingly enough, the two language models, the one assumed by most people in theology or religious studies, and it is also assumed in large part in the scientific community. Albert Einstein had a version of this, science without religion is lame, religion without science is blind. That is to say, if science can give us factual knowledge about this world and religion can give us meaning, purpose, and most importantly, value, and a, more, a sense of moral responsibility, then society needs both science and religion to be healthy. Increasingly in the science and religion dialogue, ears are turned toward voices coming from indigenous experience, the voices of Amerindians or Aborigines in Australia, those who have experienced autochthony, that's that sense of belonging to the land and, of course, to the natural systems, the plants and the insects and the animals that are associated with a given place, something experienced both personally as well as carried on through the traditions. Is this an authentic 
form of knowing? Well, if you believe in scientism, the answer is no. Remember, science is the only form of knowing. So science, like a bulldozer, just uh, rapes and pillages uh, the land that uh, once was uh, sacred uh, to indigenous peoples. So I put indigenous voices in the two language model because there's a claim, a yearning, a thirst to have the kind of knowing that autochthonous religious traditions have had all along as legitimate and authentic and genuine and not uh, to be judged by or rejected by scientific knowing. If two people speak different languages and they want to understand each other, they have to engage each other in order to develop that horizon of common understanding. Here's Pope Francis. He seems to presuppose the two language view, but he wants dialogue to carry us beyond merely speaking separately. Science and religion with their distinctive approaches to understanding reality, can enter into an intense dialogue fruitful for both. That is to say, the conversation between science and theology could benefit both science and theology. Here in this article, we see Islamic scholars directly engaged in the dialogue between uh, science and faith. And note, <laughs> they reject the two language view. No, there's only one reality. And any knowledge that we gain through science still has to be subjected to the authority of the glorious Quran. We are looking at non-warfare models. We've just taken a look at the two books and the two languages. Now we're going on to the next in our list, ethical alliances. Scientists and theologians and other religious leaders have demonstrated common cause in a number of crucial areas, one of which is ecology and ecological ethics. Take a look at this document drawn up in 1992. It was a conference drawing together religious leaders from a variety of different churches, as well as scientists, some of whom in other cases are quite belligerently anti-religious, Carl Sagan and Edward O. Wilson, uh, for example. Uh, but there's Ian Barber's name, whom we mentioned uh, earlier, as well as Robert John uh, Russell as well. But note, despite their differences in understanding how reality works, they can affirm together a shared responsibility for making our planet a healthy place. We believe that science and religion are working together. Look at that have an essential contribution to make toward any significant mitigation and resolution of the world environmental crisis. That's 1992. The world really listened <laughs> to this joint appeal, didn't it? Ha! We reaffirm here in the strongest possible terms the indivisibility of social justice and the preservation of the environment. This is uh, an item extremely important to religious leaders, social justice. And one of the problems uh, in the analysis of the ecological crisis is that the poorer peoples of the world suffer disproportionately because uh, we refuse, uh, the global society refuses to attend to the reality of the crisis that is before us. Uh, this is my Berkeley colleague, uh, Professor Rita Sharma, a Hindu theologian. 
And here she is responding to uh, Pope uh, Francis's Laudato Si document. Note what she's doing here. It's almost a version of the two books, but what's so important is that a theologian interested in science tries to draw a connection between her understanding of God's work in the world, science, and your and my responsibility to uh, the planet, to the health of the planet, and more than that, <laughs> the beauty of the planet. It's sometimes thought that science just races ahead with wildcat research and those who are concern, concerned about the moral fiber of society have to chase after them. That certainly has not been true when it comes to the stem cell controversy, uh, nor even uh, the genomics uh, research that had preceded it. Why? Because the scientists initially invited ethicists in to uh, monitor their work, and that included religious ethicists. I myself was involved uh, in uh, stem cell uh, ethical deliberation even a month before uh, the first isolation of human embryonic stem cells in August of 1998. One of the areas in which I specialize has been the relationship between genomics and genetics and stem cells on the one hand, with theology, ethics, and public policy on the other. We're ready now to move on to our next non-warfare model, dialogue. If we think about the two languages where science speaks one language with its respective version of understanding and theology speaks a separate language with its horizon of understanding. And if we place them into conversation, proximity, dialogue, interaction, might these two horizons begin to merge and converge and perhaps a single more comprehensive horizon of understanding could develop. After all, if there's only one reality, we should expect that dialogue will get us somewhere. And this is where the word consonance comes in. We have to hypothesize that if there is only one reality and science has purchase and theology has purchase, then sooner or later we'll find the two languages are speaking about only the one world in which all of us live, a world created by and blessed by its creator God. This is John Polkinghorne, president or former president of Queens College at Cambridge University, a trained mathematical physicist, as well as the part of that first generation of the pioneers in the field of theology and natural science. John begins from the two language point of view and moves through dialogue, asserting again and again there is only reality and that we must hypothetically claim consonance between what we say theologically about God and the world with what we learn about the world from natural science. And theology brings to the dialogue knowledge, genuine knowledge gained through special revelation that can be added, uh, perhaps expanded and deepened by interaction with natural science. In the last decades of the 20th century, Wolfhart Pannenberg at Munich just dominated the agenda of systematic theology worldwide and, and among, among other sources for pursuing Christian theology, natural science played a significant role. Uh, like the Muslim scholars we mentioned earlier, uh, Nasser and Iqbal, was very critical of the scientism and naturalism that seems to accompany 
what our researchers are doing in the laboratory. Genuine scientific research contributes to our knowledge of God in the world, he believes, but the overlay of science, naturalism, and such are philosophical additives that we could easily jettison. So I'm going to put Pannenberg in the dialogue uh, model because he actually did participate again and again while writing in systematic theology in interactive conversation with leading scientists. I think that V. V. Raman, the Hindu uh, scientist, belongs in the dog model largely because he has been very active in engaging in religious and scientific interaction. But notice the study here in this quotation. Vivi believes that the things we are discovering today through science were already anticipated by implicit in the ancient Hindu scriptures, the Vedas and the Upanishads. There was a sense then in which the ancient Hindu revelatory scriptures trump science, but not quite the way the Quran trumps science for the Muslims. Rather, the ancient Hindu scriptures are complemented by almost as though this is exegete and explicate and explain truths that were already present in the past. So dialogue is important for V.B. Raman because dialogue functions as a way of interpreting the ancient Hindu scriptures. Sangeetha Menon uh, from Bangalore in India draws our attention immediately to three items, consciousness, agency, and self-identity. And these belong in the subjective side of the interior life. Scientific method, as you know, is strictly objective in character. But in recent decades, the neurosciences and related areas of research have begun to investigate the interior of your and my mental intellectual consciousness through brain studies to provide some sort of explanation. Well, the Hindu tradition, along with the Buddhist tradition, over a couple of millennium has studied human consciousness with some detail. So in this period of time, we can expect a rich dialogue to emerge between this tradition that understands human consciousness from the inside and the new knowledge that is being produced experimentally by the sciences. Scripture scholar uh, Norbert Samuelson has been one of the leading Jewish intellectuals in the engagement uh, between uh, religion and science, and he stresses that Jewish culture has always celebrated uh, and embraced secular knowledge gained through the uh, sciences. So we only need dialogue, so to speak, uh, in order to provide something concrete as to how the harmonization between faith and knowledge uh, are to be constituted in each generation, including our own. Lisa Stenmark is a Lutheran theologian teaching at San Jose State University. She's a feminist, a deconstructionist, postmodernist, critical theorist. She's very concerned about local knowledges, the kind of knowledge and understanding gain uh, tocthanally, as we mentioned earlier regarding um, indigenous peoples. And so in the science and religion dialogue or discourse, there is nobody who speaks for all of religion. You've got a variety, a plurality, a multiplicity 
of religious experiences, traditions, and horizons of understanding. And one doesn't expect from dialogue a single uh, meta worldview, so to speak, to emerge, but rather to accept the plurality of perspectives that might uh, result from it. Uh, Lisa also sponsors what she calls the disputational friendship that people representing one or another religious tradition ought to be able to argue and dispute uh, over the nature of reality with uh, their scientific friends. Nancy Murphy is one of the giants in the field of theology and natural science. She's been teaching philosophy of religion and philosophy of science at Fuller Seminary Dina for a number of years. She's a postmodern thinker, an Anglo-American postmodern thinker. That is to say, she's not a deconstructionist. But she is concerned about the foundation of knowledge. And she is willing to critique the claim to, uh, to scientific knowledge, not just, not just the army of scientism, natural reductionism. No, the actual claim to know the world as it is that is being made uh, by natural scientists. Because there is a tacit assumption that the correspondence theory of truth works. So a scientist makes a literal statement or a mathematical formula that it corresponds accurately to the way the physical world really is. No such thing, she says. Have you ever seen an electron? How do you know what an electron is like? Well, you only use the path of it in a uh, smoke chamber, right? So anything that's said about an electron is a product of one's constructive imagination. There's nothing you can say about an electron that corresponds to the reality of the electron. So Nancy claims that modern science is sort of riding on a cloud, but pretending that it's nailed squarely to earth. So with the correspondence theory of truth, a uh, uh, part of the delusion of the modern mind, Nancy still doesn't want to give up on truth. She says, well, we have another way of determining truth. It's a little more relativistic, but it still works. It's the coherence way. You put together genuine knowledge gained in one experiment with genuine knowledge gained in another experiment and put them all together and you, you, you get a coherent picture. Well, that's as good as we can get. Funny thing, you know, that's what theologians do. Theologians don't grab God by the scuff of the collar and drop pick. No, theologians are looking at God like physicists look at the path of the electron in the cloud chamber and uh, the kind of knowledge the theologian brings to the dialogue table is quite similar to the kind of knowledge that the scientist brings to the dialogue table. CMI, Creative Mutual Interaction. Let's start with the two languages, and then we want to move towards understanding, so we engage in dialogue. And then in dialogue, we begin to influence one another science influences theology and theology influences science. Well, then we're on the cusp of creative mutual interaction. This is my friend Bob Russell again. Remember, he's both a physicist and a theologian. He's a hybrid. Take a look at that icon bridge on the cover of our journal, Theology and Science. It has been Bob's vision since 1980 to see traffic going both ways, from science to theology and theology back to science again. What 
could that mean? Well, science has already influenced the worldview of Christians and Jews when Copernicus put the sun in the middle of the solar system. Every day, new scientific discoveries and technological interventions influence the way religious people view the world, God's created world. Could the traffic go the other way? Well, take a look at that list of three possible items there at the bottom. On the one hand, theologians could help scientists understand their own work when it becomes mythical in character. Yes, scientists are capable of myth. Early in this presentation, we drew the distinction between science as research on the one hand and scientism as an ideology on top of it, that scientism is a myth piled upon the research and theologians should run around with whistles and blow these whistles when that kind of uh, mythical extension takes place. One particular area might sponsor traffic from theology to science, and that's anthropology, understanding human nature. John Calvin told us that unless you know God, you don't know yourself, truly know yourself. Well, if that's the case, then maybe the theologian could formulate a hypothesis about human nature and ask a scientist friend to go and research it. I haven't tried it yet, but, you know, Maybe it'll yield some new knowledge that both theologians and scientists could share. We are walking through the six non-warfare models. We've taken a look at the two books, the two languages, ethical alliances and dialogue leading to creative mutual interaction. Number nine, is a synthesis. We're going to call it naturalism. And in some ways, we've already looked at it when we looked at scientific imperialism. But in this case, it's a self-consciously embraced metaphysical position that says nature is the only reality. Science is its revelatory prophet. Nothing supernatural exists. Religious traditions contribute, contribute something positive in the sense that religious people or spiritual people revere what is sacred. So if you're a naturalist, you eliminate God, but move over into the domain of the sacred nature nature in its depths then becomes sacred. I list this here as a non-warfare model because it is a synthesis of science on the one hand and spiritual sensibilities on the other. There may not be belief in God. Uh, there's belief only in nature, but nature's treated wondrously, awesomely, and reverently. Naturalism is a rather large religion with a collection of denominations within it. Take a look at the titles of the books we have on our shelf here. To the far left is Romantic naturalism. That's nature, but interpreted by science, interpreted rather by the human soul. Think of the poets. I'm going to uh, take us back to William Wordsworth. Let's see if I have it memorized or not. My heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky. So it was when my life began, so is it I am a man. And so let it be when I grow old, or let me die. The child is father of the man, and I wish my days to be bound each to each in natural piety. Well, I might have messed up a word or here or there. 
Imagine you're a child and you see the moon or the rainbow or some other fantastic natural phenomenon. It's amazing. It's inspiring. It's uh, awe-evoking. Nature should do that to the human soul, says the poet. And if you and I grow old enough and take things for granted and still don't enjoy that precious sense of awe we get from realizing our relationship to the natural world, well, then we might as well be dead. So what Wordsworth wants from us, at least for himself, is natural piety, a religious piety grounded in the appreciation of nature, not nature as the scientist sees it, but nature as the human soul is affected by it. The next book is Scientific Naturalism. We've actually talked about this already with different words, talking about the army of scientism, naturalism, physicalism, reductionism. The third book is Non-Theistic Religious Naturalism. We'll see a couple of examples of this uh, in, uh, in a few minutes here. Uh, spiritual Naturalism, you can find that on the web. It's kind of a convergence of uh, spirituality, nature, and science. Theistic Religious Naturalism. We had non-theistic religious. Now, theistic religious naturalism sees God at work even if scientists don't see God at work in nature. Let me read you a poem about evolution written a hundred years ago by William Carruth. A fire mist and a planet, a crystal and a cell, a jellyfish and a saurian, and caves where the cavemen dwell. Then a sense of law and beauty, and a face turned away from the clod. Some call it evolution. Others call it God. Theistic religious naturalism. Process theism, that's the process theologians following in the footsteps of philosopher Alfred North Whitehead. As we said earlier, Whitehead's metaphysical scheme is breathtakingly comprehensive with God, the human psyche, and nature all in a single package. And so inspired have has a generation of theologians since the Second World War been that Christian doctrines are interpreted in light of Whiteheadian process philosophy. At bottom, Whitehead was a naturalist, so when we engage in process theology, is it a form of naturalism or is it a form of orthodox theology? Natural theology or natural revelation uh, is uh, the belief that God, that definitely God as creator, is revealed in the natural world and scientists can actually help grasp what's being said in nature about God. Let me find another uh, poem here. I'm going back to Henry uh, Wadsworth Longfellow now, and his poem is called The Manuscripts of God. And nature, the old nurse, took the child upon her knee, saying, here is a storybook my father hit for thee. Come wander with me, she said, in regions yet untrod, and read what is still unread in the manuscripts of God. Remember the two books model. That's what Copernicus and Kepler and Galileo and Newton, the founders of modern science, all held that God is revealed in the book of nature. So if you had a theology that's only the book of nature, you'd have a natural theology. Theology of nature we'll come back to in a few minutes. And then finally, fideism, a book that doesn't belong on the shelf. That usually refers to the theology of Karl Barth and his disciples, in which 
there is no knowledge of God. There is a relationship with God that you and I have in faith that we interpret in light of common experience. But the study of science, history, or any other discipline does not give us any knowledge about what is ultimate, God and God alone. This is Wim Dries in the Netherlands, former editor of the journal Zygon. He is a self-identified non-theistic religious naturalist. It may well be more fruitful to accept naturalism as an understanding of reality. Okay. Naturalism sees social and mental life as one of the fruits of the long evolutionary process. Non-theistic religious naturalist kind of like evolution. Religious naturalism copes with a naturalistic self understanding. So it's very much like scientific naturalism, but it's a way of orienting your spiritual life. Buddhism might be considered a form of non-theistic religious naturalism before naturalism was even born. You've got the doctrine of the non-self and nada to uh, deal with here. Now, what's happened uh, in recent decades is that Buddhism, in confrontation with the natural sciences, especially the sciences that deal with the human brain, the human psyche, uh, the inner life of consciousness, etc., provides a point of contact, dialogue, so to speak, uh, that connects the Buddhist spiritual tradition with contemporary uh, sciences of the mind. Uh, so here we have uh, Alan Wallace again, who wants to reintroduce the spirit of empiricism into religion. That is to say, Buddhism is a religious tradition based upon experience, common human experience, an extraordinary uh, meditative experience. The Buddhist challenge here is to retrieve spiritual re realities and return them to the world of experience. So the authority of Buddhism doesn't lie in its scriptures. It lies in experience. And on that count, there's a, at least a correspondence, if not an overlap, with empirical science. The final model in our list of non-warfare models we will call Theology of Nature. And this is a picture of Bob Russell again, now playing the piano. And he is quite a good pianist. So he's a physicist, he's a theologian, and a pianist. The Theology of Nature synthesizes oh, the two books and perhaps ethical alliance, but definitely dialogue and creative mutual interaction, but constructs, as St. Thomas Aquinas would say, constructs a single picture of the whole world in which everything in reality is oriented towards God. The source for the theology of nature has to be special revelation, as the two books people would uh, certainly acknowledge. But beginning with that fundamental point of departure, then everything revealed about the natural world by science or poetry and art, for that matter, also fits into this single comprehensive worldview. We'll call that a theology of nature over against the naturalism that we had uh, just taken a look at. So we've just now exhausted our list of six non-warfare models. Both Ian Barber and Celia Dean Drummond are theologians of nature. Yes, they find God revealed in the natural world. Natural theology is a part of 
what we know about God, but God's graciousness, God's redemptive plan, these things require special revelation, scripture, faith. And so you can see here both Ian and Celia uh, affirming the heart principle of the theology of nature. Recall that one of Ian Barber's four models for relating science and religion was integration. The way he himself does it is integrating everything in science and everything in theology into Whiteheadian metaphysics. And it provides a single, very comprehensive and inspiring um, worldview. Uh, Michael Dodds is a Thomist and what he does is parallel to uh, that of Ian, uh, but it's Thomistic metaphysics based upon Aristotle, and it works for him as well. So they're both theologians of nature, but the way they integrate science and theology is through a metaphysical scheme. From 1987 to 2002, CTNS in Berkeley in the Vatican Observatory at Castel Gandolfo and, of course, St. Peter's in Rome, worked together on a number of issues in the dialogue and creative uh, mutual interaction between uh, physical cosmology, uh, physics, evolution, neuroscience, etc., and uh, Christian theology. And we always had uh, in our study group of a dozen to 20, um, a few Roman Catholic, Thomas, and always a couple Whiteheadian, uh, Whiteheadian thinkers, Ian Barber participated, I think, in all of, them, all of those conversations. And it was my observation that when a difficult issue would come up, it would be easy for either the Whiteheadian or the Thomas to resolve an issue because they could just plug both the theology and the science into the metaphysical scheme and voila, everything works out harmoniously. But there were some situations where if you took away the metaphysics and just had bare theology and bare science uh, bumping up against each other, it was a good deal more difficult. Uh, take, for example, the heat death of the universe, according to Big Bang theorists who uh, rely on the principle of entropy. Um, the universe is only going to last 65 to 100 billion years in the future. And as the heat dissipates, uh, everything in the universe will go into a state of equilibrium and basically be dead. Well, that's not what the promise of the Bible looks like. I mean, the Bible promises God's coming kingdom and a renewal, a new creation of all things. And uh, the Garden of Eden that was back in the book of Genesis comes again in the book of Revelation. And so this scientific prognostication about the cosmos is not consonant. It is dissonant with that promise. And if you just sort of like run it through the metaphysical scheme and eliminate the tension and the uh, dissonance, that's a little too easy. So... Rather than integration, some theologians of nature are willing to just sort of let the dispute occur uh, between theological and scientific commitments. So I want to make two points here. First of all, the category or model of integration that Ian gave us applies to both naturalism and a theology of nature wherein it's a metaphysical scheme that integrates everything. A theology of nature can either have Barber's integration 
uh, within metaphysics model or, and you'll see this a little bit more in Bob Russell and CTNS's work, uh, just straight dialogue, straight uh, creative mutual interaction uh, without greasing the gear, so to speak, uh, with a uh, metaphysical scheme, but it's still a theology of nature. We began with a rather simple question, are science and religion really at war with one another? And we came up with multiple answers. It depends sort of on whom you ask. If you ask soldiers fighting the armies of scientism and scientific imperialism, the answer is yes, there's a war and we want religion to lose. Soldiers fighting the army of ecclesiastical authoritarianism are going to say, yes, there's a war and we want science to lose. When it comes to the evolution controversy, however, it gets a little more complex because we identified at least five armies and the creationists and intelligent design soldiers, they want Darwinian evolution to lose, whereas the theistic evolutionists and the materialists uh, in scientism, uh, let alone the laboratory researchers, they want the creationist and intelligent design forces to lose. But then we took a look at six non-warfare models, cooperative models, complementary models. The two books, Doctrine in the Middle Ages and the early uh, modern period held that God is revealed in nature, even when nature is looked at through microscopes and telescopes and complements the special revelation in scripture. The two languages, the dominant view is that science and religion speak different languages. Science gives us fact, religion gives us meaning. Then the ethical alliance brings together scientific leaders and religious leaders to deal with moral issues that confront the larger society. Dialogue can lead to creative mutual interaction in which the theologian asks that genuine science influence his or her religious worldview and offers that theological insights might lead to a progressive scientific research program. Number nine, naturalism is a synthesis. It's a worldview. It's a whole metaphysic that looks a lot like number two, scientific imperialism, but it adds a good deal more sophistication and even a reverence for the sacred depths of nature. Finally, theology of nature, which begins with special revelation in scripture, interprets what we know about God and creation, gathering in everything we can learn from the sciences and the arts to understand the one God of grace in terms of the whole magnificent world within which we live. The dominant model has been Number six, the two languages. But the media has overlooked it. The media has accidentally told us that the evolution controversy represents the entire relationship between religion and science. But now we all know better, don't we? The end is near. Take a look at tedstimelytake.com for more resources and uh, thank you for fastening your seatbelt and sharing with me this wild ride through science and religion.